Hi there, me again, your friendly neighborhood humble stroke assaulter. So we're now going to discuss uh, post-stroke role change and disruption at work. So this is going to be the first video I'm going to do about, just in general terms, about the returning to work planning of you getting ready to go back to work, right? What it will look like, what it should look like, what it could look like, and kind of what you're going to go through. And I'm going to base some of this off of my experience and some off literature, and I'll leave the links in the description down below. So I've done videos on, you know, social disruption and family disruption and, and other forms of disruption and role change you'll have post-stroke. <clears throat> now let's talk about work. So if you are not of retirement age and you've had your stroke, there's kind of an expectation on many levels you're going to go back to work, right? That could be from you, that could be from your employer, that could be from insurance, that could be from your family. There's many, many reasons why you're going to be expected to go back to work. And let's be honest, a lot of us that are younger, that are not yet ready to retire, <clears throat> we have a lot of wrapped up in our work identities, right? That's an identity we have. So we're going to just, just discuss initially, just in generalities, some of the post-stroke role changes and disruptions you're going to have as you begin your returning back to work. And we're going to have all these videos we're going to do about returning to work, we're going to have a caveat. Uh, that your doctor, your neurologist, your psychologist, your physiotherapist, your occupational therapist, your speech and language pathologist, uh, anybody else that's involved in your world clinically and professionally, they've all agreed you get to go back to work, right? They've all agreed that you are suitable, ready, and able to go back to work. So you, you play many roles at work. One, work is a social environment, right? So you have the social interaction at work. Uh, work also is a place where you get to express a different side of you. You can, you know, a different form of creativity, a different form of um, knowledge, a different form of intelligence, a different form of, you know, humor. Like there's many different things you do at work that you don't do at home or in any other instance. <laughs> You know, you're part of a team at work. You're part of, could be various teams at work. So in my case, I'm an agent. I, I help customers directly. <clears throat> I'm also a trainer. So when I'm in my agent role, I'm one part of the team. When I'm in my training role, I'm in a different part of the team. And on a different team at the same time. Uh, because I'm a trainer and an agent, uh, I also help support agents when they need help. So I've... And we'll discuss my post-stroke role change and disruption in, in a minute or two. So just think about the different roles you play at work. Now, because we as younger stroke folk place a lot of value on going to work. One, it, it gives you structured time. During your rehab, you're going to be at home for a lengthy period of time. You're going to have a lot of unstructured time. So getting that advantage of going into a structured facility to do things in a structured manner for a predetermined period of time is actually kind of an advantage. The difficulty is, as we've discussed before, uh, transitions, right? And again, for those that have never watched any of my other videos before, a transition for our purposes is either a state and change of ability and or a state and change of care. <clears throat> well, I'm doing both. I'm now proving I can go back to work. So there's a state and change of ability, right? I'm now able to return back to my work. I'm able to be a functional member of that place. Then you have this change in state of care. <clears throat> my previous state of care was I was at home doing my rehab and recuperation and whatnot. Now I'm at work. And again, like any time you do or have during the post-stroke journey, anytime you have a transition, you want to check yourself to make sure you're not starting to come under the grips of depression, anxiety, or any other mental health related difficulty with stroke. Uh, and I would encourage anyone that is going back to work, get a counselor, right? And, and have them help you with the mental anxiety and anguish that you may experience while getting ready to go back to work. It just makes sense. So on that note, let's just talk about some of the things that might be a hindrance or a barrier for you getting ready to go back to work. <clears throat> Do you have stroke symptoms 
or deficits post-stroke that impair your ability to do your job. Right? Something like, for example, let's say you're a tradesperson and you're a carpenter or you're an electrician or you're a welder. Something that is both a physically demanding job and a mentally demanding job. Right? Well, if, if you can't do addition and subtraction, cutting lumber might be an issue to the right dimensions. <clears throat> Uh, if you don't have good manual dexterity, using a hand tool or a power tool might be difficult. Um, do you have fatigue? You know, and anyone that's had a stroke, you're going to have post-stroke fatigue. That's just a, a given thing. Did you have a pre-existing psychological deficit before your stroke, or do you now now have one after your stroke? Right? How stressful is your job? Right? Or how how much stress do you perceive your job is going to be? So if you're an air traffic controller, going back to work after stroke may not be the best idea. Let's just be honest there. And then, <clears throat> are you in a situation where the people that are administering your benefits are more encouraging you, no, you don't need to go back to work, right? Now, what are some of the positive factors, influencing factors, <clears throat> that'll help you be more successful in returning back to work? How determined are you? Right? How much determination do you have to make this work? How patient are you? Right? Um, how willing are you to adapt if you need to? Right? Then you've got how much support do you have from friends, family, coworkers? Obviously, the more people around you that support you, the more likely you're going to be successful. Then how much support are you getting from your healthcare team? That be your neurologist, your general practitioner, your speech and language pathologist, your physiotherapist, your occupational therapist, your therapist, therapist, whatever, anyone else thrown in there that, that you may not use that I haven't thought of, right? Uh, are they willing to sign off on you going back to work? Are they able to give you strategies to cope with the things that might come up during work? Um, have they given you the right medical documentation for adaptive devices at work, whatever that may be. Um, then when you get beyond that hurdle, do you live in a region? I live in the province of Ontario in Canada, so I'm good this way. Do you live in a region that has disability legislation where your job is protected, where like they can't get rid of you, you get to go back to work? Um, do you live in a region where you have statutory sick leave, where A, not only is your job protected, but they have to take care of you <clears throat> somehow, right? And then along with that, how are your bills being paid? Are they being paid through like unemployment insurance, workman's comp, uh, some kind of pension plan through the government, uh, you know, are they paid through your insurance or your work, private insurance, whatever. Um, and then the last thing is your employer, right? How flexible is your employer? Right. And obviously, if your employer is very flexible and they're, they're willing to be sympathetic and empathetic to your situation, it, it's, it's going to go better for you. <clears throat> so let's just talk about a few things that have been my observations. So firstly, if you're considering going back to work, don't jump right in. You just attempting to run right back into work is going to be a big mistake. So I'm going to encourage you. You're going to want to have a conversation with your employer and your neurologist and set it up. So you start out like I did. Uh, I work. Three weeks for two, uh, three hours a day for two weeks, and then I work four hours a day for two weeks, and then on that fourth week, I then move to five hours a day for one week, <clears throat> and then six hours a day for one week, which is next week for me. The following week, I'll be to seven hours a day for a week, and the week after that, I go back to a full time schedule. That gives you time to get your feet wet, that gives you time to acclimatize yourself, that gives you time to figure out if this is going to work. <clears throat> more importantly it also gives you time if you need it in the first three to four weeks to book appointments if things are really going south that'll give you time to book appointments so if you have to go back on a leave you go back on a leave if you, you need some other form of accommodation you can seek it out before you're full-time again right? nextly you're gonna have to learn you are going to need help and you're going to have to learn you have to seek out and accept the help. If you need something, say something. That's if you need special computer screens, if you need to wear sunglasses indoors, if you need um, a special headset, if you need 
a modified desk, if you need a wheelchair ramp, like whatever your needs are post-stroke, those are your needs. Um, your employer <clears throat> in most jurisdictions, they have to accommodate you. They don't have a choice. Um, they, they have to get to the point of undue hardship. Whatever that legally means in your jurisdiction, that's for you to figure out. Because I'm not going to say, well, in the state of Illinois, it means this, and the province of Alberta, and that, and in, 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 in England, it means this, and Australia means that, and it means something completely different in Romania. So I'm not going to even try to give you what that means. That'll be up for you in the geographic and political region you live in to research. Right? Because you now, for me, for example, I was off work for six months. So I have not done my job for six months. I also have the added benefit of having a stroke, brain injury, you know, the thinker don't work so well. So there's no way I'm just going to be able to jump back in because things have changed in six months. Some of the tools I use have changed. Some of the computer programs I use have changed. How I do my job has slightly changed. <clears throat> I didn't know that was a thing until I showed up. So there's no way you're going to be ready for that. But again, the most important thing is if you need something, say something. People can't help you if they don't know. <clears throat> you're going to get frustrated. You're going to get frustrated for a couple of reasons. You're going to get frustrated in and about yourself, right? You're going to get frustrated because you're going to have memory without context. I don't know how I know that, but I know I know that's an answer, and I think that's the right answer, but I don't know how I know that. Then you're going to get frustrated because you can remember six, seven months ago, you could do a thing, and you can remember doing that, whatever it was, but now someone asks you to do it, you're like, uh, I don't know. Uh. And then for my case, it's a little bit worse because I used to train people to do that. I'm like, yeah, I taught that. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> to, to have to admit that is a big step. So you're going to have to check your pride at the door. You're completely and totally going to have to check your pride at the door. Right? So you're just going to have to accept that you're going to have to rebuild and redevelop your skills. And if and when needed, ask for help. Right? Next one, fatigue, exhaustion. The first couple weeks going back to work, you are going to end up being physically exhausted and mentally fatigued. The first three weeks going back to work, I only work three hours a day, five days a week for two weeks, and then four hours a day for a week. And during those three weeks, I napped religiously almost immediately when I got home. Like, sat down on a lazy boy, crawled up on the bed, whatever. I was asleep within minutes. I'd take my shoes off, take my coat off, go sit down, sleeping. Right? And that is normal. Right? That is normal. You're, the best way I can describe it is you're going to have periods of time when you're at work. It's going to feel like your brain is on fire. And, and that's the way I can describe it. That's the way it, the sensation is for me. I know when I have that feeling, my brain is doing something new, something it hasn't done since the stroke. And I know it's trying to develop new neural pathways and get all happy, happy. So just remember, you haven't been in a structured scheduled routine for a number of months. It could be three months, could be six months, could be whatever the case may be, right? It doesn't really matter how many months you've been away. You just haven't been in a structured environment. So just be mindful that you have not been in a structured environment. Be mindful that this is something you're going to have to work up to have the level of stamina that you need, right? Just remember, rest when and where you need to. Take the time to take breaks when you need to. And you know what? If you can't handle a full day at work, whatever your schedule is, just check out, right? Now, the next one, is going to be your emotional fragility and fluctuation. Because we all know with a stroke, your emotions swing like a pendulum. A very broken pendulum, but they swing. So, <clears throat> you're going to have moments, right? Because of the fatigue, uh, because of stamina, because of frustration, because of the expectations you set on yourself. For so many reasons, you're going to have emotional fluctuation, right? So, you might find yourself crying at work. Perfectly okay. I've done it. You might get home, and before you fall asleep, or after you fall asleep, or sometime when you get home, you're just going to have a 20-minute crying fit. It's, again, perfectly normal. 
I've done that. Right? If you end up crying at work, so what? It, 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 it is going to happen. You are going to end up needing to step away, needing to take a break, crying. Because the frustration, the emotional fragility, the expectations you set on yourself. I still have um, speech and language issues at times. And sometimes they come out at work. And the first week or two when they come out, I got very emotional. Because that's not me. At least not me pre-stroke. Right? So, just remember... People don't understand that with stroke comes emotional fluctuation and emotional fragility. People don't understand that with stroke uh, comes a lot of um, frustration. Right? Sometimes that emotional fragility and that, that frustration can be perceived as anger. It's not. You might be angry at yourself. Yes, that's true. But it's not meant to be directed at people. And you may need to educate people. Yeah, I'm angry right now, so to speak. It might look that way, but I'm not. I'm just upset. I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated at me. It has nothing to do with you specifically. I'm not angry at you. I'm not angry at anyone. It's just, I can remember being able to do a thing, and I can't do it right now. Right? <clears throat> then, to go along with that, comes anxiety and self-doubt. Right? So, you're going to get anxious for a whole bunch of reasons, right? You're going to have self-doubt for a whole bunch of reasons, right? You've now got to go into the building, and the building has people, and now you got to navigate around people. And then then they expect you to be productive and do your job, and you're worried about, am I going to be able to keep my job? So there's a whole lot of reasons why you may be having a whole bunch of anxiety going back to work and a whole bunch of self-doubt going back to work. And the only thing I can say to that is before you get ready to go back to work, you go get a counselor. You go get a counselor, you work with them, and they help you put the pieces back together so your anxiety is lessened, so you know how to deal with a self-doubt, and, and you do it that way, right? All I'm going to encourage you is you find a counselor that's actually certified, licensed, and trained in your area by a government body, right? Like a college of social workers or a college of psychiatrists or whatever, right? We've got two more to cover. People. Your coworkers. There's a sense of social isolation after a stroke. And some of the people you're going to work with, they're never going to get what you've been through. And, and they're never going to understand what you've been through. And that's okay. Because as long as they can admit, hey, you know what? You've been through a shit state. I just don't get it. That that's pro I, I accept that. Right? You're going to get some people that are scared to even want to talk to you because they're afraid they're going to set your brain off. And they're going to cause another stroke or they're awkward and they don't know what to say or they're afraid they're going to insult you. You're also going to get a small select few that are going to think that strokes are contagious and they might catch it if they're within three feet of you. Um, some of your coworkers might perceive you as damaged. Right? That, that's on them. Right? If you are able to willingly show up to work every single day, do the job that you know how to do, the best you can do it, including the limitations you have, and get results, so what? If they want to think you're still damaged, fuck them. Right? You're then going to have a very unique, small population that have never had a stroke. They have no real knowledge of stroke, and they're going to try to give you advice. Hey, I got some great advice. Fuck you. That's all I have to say to that. Don't. Don't try to give me your magical stroke advice because I'm going to ask you, have you had a stroke? Yeah, then no. You, you really have no idea what you're talking about. Has anyone in your family had a stroke? Oh, then you probably don't know what you're talking about. So I love it when people try to give me advice about what my stroke is all about when A, they've never really asked me any questions about my stroke and, and B, they try to think they know what stroke's about when they've never had a stroke or a brain injury or a major neurological event. Okay. The key to your coworkers is find a small select cadre of trusted individuals that you can work with, that you can share your experiences with, share your difficulties with, and, and they can be there to encourage you and assist you, you know, and, and, and check in on you from time to time. That's one of the things I really love about my coworkers that I trust. They check in on me constantly. This is Sam doing okay. And, and that's wonderfully appreciated. And then lastly, the most important piece, 
celebrate your victories, celebrate your successes, right? Stroke took so much away from you, right? Think about this. The filing cabinet that was your life got tipped over and all those files went skittering across the floor. And you've had to take a number of months to pick those file folders up and find out if the file folder is even got the right contents in it and then put it back in the right place in that filing cabinet. And now you're making the ultimate transition back to work. Celebrate your victories celebrate your successes right? and, and the way I do that is I keep a journal I journal every day what my day was like do I have a headache don't I have a headache what my anxiety is like what my aphasia is like my apraxia my anomia all that wonder like all my symptomology post-stroke so I kind of have a benchmark and then I, if there's something specific that happens I'll journal about that if it's just sort of general anxieties and, and angst throughout the day or successes so over a course of three four or five weeks I can see how things are getting easier, things are getting better, things that are triggers, things that I'm concerned about, things that I'm curious about. And it works. It works perfectly well. You know, I see in five weeks a definitive improvement. There's still improvement to be made, but I see an improvement at work in, in me. Um, and uh, I'm glad. So ultimately, when it comes to the post-stroke role disruption and change, right, uh, what's going to happen is this, right? We are going to be involved in a num num number of videos, right? Those videos are going to be involved, the transition from home back into the work field. And I'm going to do a series of them. This is the first one, just speak in general terms of what, what initially you want to consider when you're getting ready to go back into the workforce and what you want to consider as you are getting back there and, and, and dealing with some of the stumbles and hurdles as you start to return back to work. <clears throat> if you happen to know uh, anyone that is going through their own post work journey or someone supporting someone going through their own post work journey, please like, share, subscribe to the channel, point it out to them. Uh, if you've enjoyed what you've been watching over the last seven months, please like, share, and subscribe. If there's something you want to see me cover, please uh, reach out to me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. I say again, if there's something you want to see me cover, reach out to me at strokeassaulter at gmail.com. And if you happen to see someone around you, or even in yourself, it starts to look kind of, you know, a bit not right, and you think maybe they're having a stroke or another neurological event, you know, someone who looks, uh, appears befuddled or confused, right? Someone who's having vision problems, they, they, they can't see out of one eye, they see in grayscale, they only see like a little tiny dot in the world. Um, oh, sorry, a little tiny dot in the world. Um, <clears throat> someone that uh, has a facial droop, one of the sides on their face is drooping. They can't raise both arms equally effectively or at all. They can't smile equally effectively or at all. They have slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context. They uh, have general body weakness. They, you know, they can't stand unaided. Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple can save a life.